No one has asked to do the, the essay on the Norwegian. Not yet, okay. You do it next week. So, uh, now it's on? Yeah. yeah, here we go. London also has led um, what we have, what he called a shadow banking system, which means that they are a kind of banks, but not a regular or open system. We call it, in Norway, we call it a grey market. Not to be mixed with a dark black market, which is a little bit different. But we have had, with periods with strong regulations of financial institution, we have had what we call a grey market. Where you can lend money, but not within the official regulated <coughs> system. Okay. Do the Norwegians know of a Norwegian bank failure? And I think they would look at you and say, no, all Norwegian banks are sound and safe. Nowadays. <laughs> Nowadays. It changed in 1990. In fact, the Norwegian parliament decided to let them go bankrupt because they voted over the uh, the taking over of the banking system and should the stocks have a value of one or zero? And that is a very easy question to answer, yes or no. Zero, yes, then one is no. One is yes, then zero is the other way. So guess what they voted? Nowadays we call it the Icelandic system. Zero. State took over. The government owned the three largest Norwegian commercial banks for a period. Like they did in Iceland. Did they lose money on it? Answer is either yes or no. And the answer is no. no. With one exception, what was called the credit cousin, K Bank. Uh, they lost money on that, but they gained a lot of money on the, the others. So yes, they got money out of it. So if you have a bank failure, do as they did in Iceland, now a few years back, or in Norway. There are money enough. People will still need banks. Guess if the Icelander would start buy, no, stop buying because there are no banks. No, they established the banks again. None of you have been to Iceland. I was happy to be there one summer and had an English guide who was very fond of Iceland and very little fond of England. What you don't know is Iceland is about the size of England. In Iceland lives about 320,000 people. In England it's about 60 million. So he was taking us out from Reykjavik, out of town and so, now you will see the congestion in Reykjavik. And there was one car there and one car there. And then he compared it to the congestion in London. Then you might understand he was a little bit fond of Iceland because he was not very fond of congestion because he was a car driver. Okay. At the time that uh, the Icelandic banks broke down completely, they were accused for terrorism from UK because they didn't want to pay back the money that British uh, people had put into the bank as deposits. And then he said, what a nonsense. The money are already in UK. Guess where they were? Not in London, but in tax evasion places like Gersney and Jersey. So he said, I'm not very fond of my Prime Minister George Brown, but if he wanted his money, just cross over to the islands. The money is there, go and pick it up. So therefore, there was enough money within the Icelandic banking system to survive, and they did. The problem is, if you have a banking system that offers 10 times the GDP of your country, then you have small problems as long as there are no problems. But what happens if you are big troubles? 
then you have the biggest troubles of all in that period. Okay, how can we handle such failures? Is do it as we did in Norway and Iceland, let them go bankrupt. Let the state take over. That doesn't sound very interesting if you are an American president to do. So they ended up at six. And none of you know David Stewart, do you? He's a talk show host that suggested the alternative of bailout or bailout. That was, why not give this money to those who have the houses and own this or, or have borrowed this money from the banks? So send them through the borrowers into the banking system instead of straight into the system. No one has ever answered his questions. But the Norwegian Icelandic answer to it is, you lost the money, let's take over the bank. We're going to see that uh, the consumers will have banking system. It's owned by the state. Not a very lucrative for American politicians, but it could have worked. And I think David Stewart has a point, but unfortunately he's not a professor in economics and he was not able to stop the bailout of it. But okay, how can we guarantee the money that you put into a saving or commercial bank? Is by one, what we call deposit insurance. In Norway, when the banks went bankrupt in 1990, we established an insurance system that guarantee for two millions Norwegian krona in each bank account for all that has put deposits into the bank. So if you have two millions, put it in one account. If you have four millions, put it in an eight. This is mathematics, yes. So you guarantee for all the money in the bank by an insurance system paid by the banks. Two, uh, you also reduce the, let's say, possibility to lend out with what we call requirements. Either to have reserves, because one day if there is a shock, all the German students come running and say, I want my money now. Okay, we have a reserve for those very little risk lovers from Germany. But for the rest, they will still stick to the bank. So for most of us, it's not a problem. So think about the fifth could be guarantee because the fifth of us one out of five will come running immediately. Put it in their mattresses. In comes a burglar and the money is gone, but that is a different story. We have also capital requirements which demand the banks to have a capital base in the banking uh, itself. Then we have asset restrictions, which is hard to guarantee if you are in the US. Because in Norway, if you are an investment institu institution, financial institution doing investment, you cannot be linked to the bank. They are split in two different. It's not like that in the US. Then you have bank examination. That is not what you have a written one of in May. But it's simply somebody knocking on the door one day and say, OK, let's look up and see your accounts, see your reserves see you how your let's say, risk profile is and things like that. So they come and knock on your door. It's some people. They might have, let's say, education from Germany, so they, they are even cleverer than the other ones. But they come and knock on your door to check out. Then we have lender of last resort facilities. In Norway, this is known as the gold card. None of you have heard of it. Okay. In January 9, 2009, when the financial crisis struck Norway, the finance, Minister of Finance in Norway said, OK, if you are running into problem and you are a bank, the Norwegian bank will get you the money. Use the card, get it out of the Norwegian bank, which is the Norwegian State Bank, 
the Federal Bank, and then you will be safe for a shorter period. <coughs> so that is what we call lender of last resort facilities. Bailout is the version that Norway reacted like Iceland. I would prefer the David Stewart solution, but since I'm not president, vice president, or even the minister of finance of US, they never asked me. But they could have called a Norwegian minister of finance to get a good advice. Okay? We had already the right regulation in place. We had a guarantee for any of the deposits. So no one needed to worry about the Norwegian banks. And in addition, you will look at us and say, and then you had this bloody fund of yours. And that helped, of course. <coughs> the instrument is very costly. I think if you ask, not necessarily Krugman, but uh, one of his colleagues, Josef Stieglitz, he would say, this impression of being something that could not go bankrupt was created by somebody, guess who? One of the, I would not say millions, but many lobbyists in Washington at the Capitol that were trying to sell the concept that banks are too big to go bankrupt. <coughs> they were even bigger in Iceland, 10 times the GDP. No one can compete with that in US. I mean, there are at least 10 banks, and they do not have 10 times the American GDP. Yes, they can go bankrupt. But no American politician were willing to bet on it. And therefore, David Stewart lost the battle. But if we can go back, let's say, six years in time, in the summer of 2008, and let they choose another president, because they choose a new president in uh, November that year, after the breakout of the financial crisis. And that president would be David Stewart. The history would have looked different. But the problem is, for US, no doubt, they had no regulations. They dropped the regulations they already had. They regulated the bank system, guess when? 1929, 30s. There was another crisis like that. When it comes to effect on the American economy, probably bigger, what we call the Great Depression. Then they regulated the bank system. It lasted to, I think, in the middle of the 70s, at least at the late 70s. Then they elected a new president who was an actor. Yes. And his. One of his basic political assumptions was st the state is the problem. And then I will look at him and say, if you have a bank system like yours, I think I would prefer the state and not the problem. But they got a problem. OK? This is not the first crisis. This is not the first bubble. The dot com is, I think, around 2003, isn't it? Uh, there is a bank crisis or a crisis in Asia in 1998. But I think there are two bubbles before that in the US. So there are always bubbles. So if you ask me, and not Krugman or the, uh, the American president, I think you need to regulate the financial sector to avoid problems like that. Do something that can reduce the risk of the bubbles. OK, then you can look at those and say, you have a bubble in Norway. We call it a housing bubble. Not yet. <laughs> well, there is one problem with Norway. Try to live outside or outdoors in Norway for a longer winter period. That's one. Two, many of the Norwegian couples split up. Guess who decides who will stay outdoors and indoors? None of them. So they need an extra house. Will there be need for more houses in Norway in the future? Well, we are more of us. 
We split up more families. We get kids. And some of us live longer. Do we need more houses? I think the answer is. So I'm not afraid of the bubble yet. And then I have a million in a fund somewhere out there in Regent Street. So I can collect the money and say, OK. I stay overnight outside the shop in Regent Street because they have hot, streaming, warm air. You might have seen it. Okay. The first time we went to London with students was in 1991, I think it was, or two. They were fighting for the hot places outside the shops, those living on the streets. Have you seen many Norwegian living on the street the last week or the week before? No, not many. Not many. So all of us need houses. We are gradually increasing in numbers. We split up. And the houses are not smaller, but that is a different story. Okay. To understand the financial crisis, we need to look at the, fig <coughs> the, the figure. But first, there are open links between financial markets. That means if there is a crisis in France, it leaks over via the bank system into all of EU. And then we can say, OK, we are safe. No. We are linked to EU, so it leaks into any economy. The problem is, is this system regulated enough? And the answer is, not the biggest one, not the US one. And if you don't know any of the relatives of Ronald R, I blame it on Ronald. He started it, but he's not the only one. We had one called Bill, known for smoking cigars. He could have done something with it because he was president for two periods. In this period, it was a bubble or two. Why didn't he stop it? He prefers smoking cigars. You cannot prob solve problems if you smoke cigars. We know no one sees you and are not able to speak to you because I have an asthmatic reaction. I cannot speak now. So that's it. They didn't solve the problem. They knew about it, but they did not do anything about it. We have instruments to solve the problems. We used it in Iceland and before that in Norway. So guess who I blame? It's not the finance minister of EU. But it is a vice president of the US. He could have done something, because he's not doing almost nothing. The only job of the vice president of the US, do you know what it is? Have you seen one? Do you know his name? <laughs> Who is vice president in the US? Joe Biden. Joe Biden. What is Joe Biden's job? You can see him you know, on American television every day if you want to. He's the Speaker of the House, the Senate. Where do they come up with the most important regulation laws in the US? In the Senate, where he is the Speaker. So one should have whispered, David Stewart should have taken him aside and said, Hey guy, there is an alternative. Vote for it. But they didn't. So who's to blame? Oh, Joe Biden was too late. It started much earlier. So the vice president of Bill Clinton was? Yes, he tried to be elected. In fact, if you keep it between us, he lost the election by two votes. No, at three votes. Guess who voted? The US Supreme Court decided to stop the counting of votes in Florida, where the difference between Al Gore and George Bush were diminishing and diminishing every day as they recounted. And then the Supreme Court of US voted three 
against two to stop the county. So probably Al Gore could have been the president. But I'm afraid if you ask me, I'm not sure if he would regulate the American banking system. But like any other history, we will never know because he lost by one vote. This is the system for federal banks. So you see they're linked together. So are the banking system as well. So if there is a problem in one of these, this problem will ripple out into the system. But the major gospel of Krugman is simply this. Get a banking system working. This will ease trade. And the more we trade, the better we are off, all of us. And then you will look at me and say, but what happens to the Greek labor that's now unemployment? And my answer could be, get the money from the financial market where the interest rate is now about zero. How much do you have to pay for money you lend if it's zero? Can you then afford to lend money? Yes. So why not spend more free money? Because actually it is free, so to speak. And use it within the EU system. Because now the fair deflation simply means it's not enough demand in the economies. But OK, now you are here. You are not any of the politicians deciding in the EU system. But when we meet in my wheelchair, period, we can discuss this because then it's at least 10 years from now on. So the financial crisis is spread through a system. It could only be avoided if the, the American system had been better regulated. How can we solve it then? is by an international regulatory regime. Who will do it? International Monetary Fund? Probably UN? Do you think it would be easy to install? Do you know of many who would operate this? No. But there is a need for it. OK. Therefore, as long as there are no international regulatory regimes, it is of domestic responsibility. And we are soon close to what is my answer to the problem. Not Joe Biden, but Al Gore. Because he was in the position to do something in those. But he was not the only one, because you need a majority. So there are at least 59 others to blame. Because I think you are six, need a 60. Probably it's enough with 50. So then it's 49 but you have the problem. So the final questions for chapter 21, for those of you who intend to read the whole of it, is this. Has the system come up with the, let's say, instrument that is necessary to ease trade? What is a jobs? They should do two things. One, two. So if you've done the first, it's only one left. So it should be easy to remember. But one is get enough capital into the system so you can pay or lend or the money will move so the goods and services can flow more freely. The problem is I don't know the risk of my investment. Have they been able to solve the risk? For most of it, yes. Even in Japan or the Asian crisis, they gradually are coming out of the problem, but it takes a very long time. So it's very hard to solve the risk in one. But yes, they can handle it for most of the cases. But next time an American voices sounds on your cell phone and say, hey, I have a very good investment project for you, you should then ask, or answer three things. Are you from an American bank? And he says, well, 
are you one of the regulators of the American Bank? And he says, no. Then your answer is, no. I'm not interested in your investment project before I know what is in it. And so far, I don't know what is in it, so call my neighbor, because he has much more money than me. He's Swedish. Okay? It is unstable or not stable enough. And it was proved by the financial crisis of 2008. But as I said, this is not the first time. Dot com, Asia, there are bubbles and bubbles and bubbles. If you read, I think it's Stieglitz, you will see there has been bubbles all the time. The difference is it was regulated till the 80s. So up till the 80s, you could partly cope with it. Even in the 90s, you could. But when the interest rate is zero, then I think you have to be Messiah. Or at least if it's an American musical, it has to be him to solve this. Because no one else can do it. Why was the interest rate zero? You can study in your master program. But I think it's called monetarism. And that can be your thesis when you write your master in two years, three years time from now, okay? Call me if I'm the advisor of the American president at that time, and then I will give you very good hints of how to read, okay? The system itself has worked very well because it has given the consumers the right or the, the possibilities to increase their consumption. So it made every consumer better off, almost every, till 2009. It has generated innovations. Hedge fund is one of them. Where you have got money from people with money and no ideas to people with a lot of ideas but no money. So yes, it works. And if you meet me in the street and say, no, I disagree with you because you don't say it here. Then I would say, have you heard of Microsoft? And they would say, what is that? No. Have you heard of Apple? Yes, I bought one. Yes. Then you did the right thing. Yes, this came up with money to very good ideas. And without this innovation, it would never work. Do we need new instruments? Yes. Do we need uh, more consumption? Yes. And I look at the French and say, no, I would blame it on the Germans. Because they have a surplus that you don't have. But we can discuss it during a break. Because if it gets into, let's say, manual fights, uh, then I know a doctor, so don't worry. We can fight it all over, also with hands. It has given people with money the opportunity to allocate money where it's most profitable to put them. And if it's more profitable, they can increase their income. What happens to their consumption if they increase their income? It goes up, either now or in the future. For those of you very interested, there is a table But there are obviously welfare gains by a very good working financial and banking system. Simply because what I buy now, I will consume in the future too. So I need also intertemporal trade. I don't think it is important, but it influences exchange rate, the rate, interest rate differentials. But I'm afraid it goes up and down. Uh, and for those who know, uh, there is a Danish songwriter who had made a song about things goes up, must come down. But then remember, things that goes down must one day come up again. 
There is a famous local uh, manager of a very big aluminium plant in Sundalsara who once put this into words. He said, in Sundalsara where we produce aluminium, the prices of aluminium is going down and all of us fear for the future and say, no, we don't fear for the future because if it's going down, it will be coming up again. The problem is if you think it's going up and up and up because in the future, it will go down. So you have to organize or manage the production, taking into account that things are not stable, but varies. Volatile, what does volatile actually mean? It's simply sun on the west coast of Norway on a Tuesday. It's there and all of a sudden it's gone. You saw it once. You don't know where it is any longer. Volatile, you just disappear in seconds. So if you don't remember what it is, think of the sun that you saw this Tuesday on the west coast of Norway. Afterwards, I have the feeling it was sun there. But no, I'm not any longer. So volatile seems, it just disappeared into thin air, gone forever. <coughs> But through the financial system, there are flowing of money. This influences national output. And since it influences national outputs, it also influences fiscal variables. And what is fiscal variables? Yeah? Taxes. Yeah. And public consumption. Or do you know of any state that collects taxes and taxes and taxes and never spend them? No. So there are two components of fiscal variables. Either tax or consumption. Public consumption. Because I think in most countries taxes are public taxes. Pay to the public sector. I don't mean uh, there can be examples in Greece, I think, where you pay, but then you do not call it taxes, I think, to individual professionals, things like that. But that is a different stuff. So fiscal variable simply means if you produce more, then people earn more income, and they pay tax. So the more they earn, the more tax there is. What should you use this tax for? Don't put it away in a bank, but use it or consumption, because that helps all of us and increase. Okay? So the system has gradually improved to be better. We all gain by it because we trade more. If it's not working, and here I think David Stewart will have a different opinion than the president of US, but that is a story that you can tell in a movie one day when you are, let's say, the new famous French director who made these very good financial market movies that are now popular on internet and you can stream them during lectures in international economics at a local university if you want to. But the answer is the system has been functioning and has been to the good, but there are few exceptions. Unfortunately, they are too big because they are American. Okay, so then a very short history of Norwegian trade history. And then you will know what barter is and why we were not using currency in the beginning. Why didn't we use currency in the beginning? Because Spain and Portugal had not found their colonies in Southern America, so we didn't have enough gold or silver. So we had to trade goods by goods. We did this uh, for 1,200 years almost. I think the first, do you know when Norway got their Norwegian Federal Bank? One, two, three Norwegians. Two hundred and three years ago, I think it was, 1811 or 186. That was the first time we had a federal bank. So that was the first time we could have our own currency. 
So till then, we were unions. Norway were a union with Denmark, with Sweden, with Sweden and Denmark. Denmark were a union with Finland. Uh, Denmark were in a union with Iceland and Faroe Islands. So we have always been in unions. So that made, let's say, the trade opportunity small. Where did we start? Was up in the Barents Sea, north, very close to the North Pole. But it was not ice up there. So we collected furs up there and transported it to the UK and bought what we needed there and took it home, partly to the White Sea up there. Why did we trade? We needed consumption of goods that we were not producing ourselves. So in fact, the great, 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 great grandmother of Krugman, who might have been a German, because Krugman sounds like a German name, once met a Norwegian, Norwegian, not a Norwegian Viking, but a Norwegian Norwegian, on his way to England. And he stopped and said, what are you doing? I'm trading. Why are you trading? Because I'm not producing myself. Well, that sounds like a very good day. We call it indirect production, and that started it. Why did we go to UK? Simply because they were almost understand what we were speaking. I think according to uh, linguists in UK, the Nordic and English language in the period were quite similar. So when we spoke to the English, they could speak to us, and we understood each other. It's almost like speaking to a Dutch if you are Norwegian and speaking slowly. Yep. So we learned how to do. We learned them two words: ski and bag. In Norwegian, what you have there is a bag. We don't say bag; we said bag at that time. So yes, we gave them a few words that they still stick to. But yes, we sent our goods that we traded up north over across the channel and took it back home. According to a Norwegian professor, North Sea was about the size of a big river. So all you needed was a canoe. I'm not sure if he's right, but I wasn't there, so I cannot challenge his position. But I think he might be underestimating the number of or the liters of water in there. Okay, so then we are back to the basic. Norway has normally traded with its nearest neighbors. And the nearest neighbors are Sweden, Denmark, and UK. Do they trade with euros in UK? Do they trade with euros in Denmark? Do they trade with euros in Sweden? So most of Norwegian trade is integrated with EU, but not with the Eurozone. The closest link we have is to Germany. Yeah. So we are integrated into the German economy, but compared to Sweden, Denmark, and UK, minor part of Norwegian trade will be with them. OK? So yes. There is probably a link between Norway and U uh, EU, but not with the Eurozone. So if you meet Paul Krugman the day before you return here on the 10th year anniversary with the new wheelchair, tell him that probably the example is good if you move it to the south instead of Norway, because Switzerland, nearest neighbor are Austria, Italy, France, and Germany. Do they have euros in Germany, in France, in Italy, and in Austria? So that would have been a better example, if you ask me. OK? So yes, Norway used to trade. We started to trade. We have, let's say, some of us would claim that we learned the Hanseatic community to trade, because we built very good sailing ships. And why did we build very good sailing ships? 
because we wanted to conquer France in a region called Normandy, which simply means where the Norm Norwegians came. Yeah. But we needed it for trade. So most of the ships that sailed across the North Sea were trading ships. Who built the newest version, the better technology, is the Hanseatic uh, community. And among them, there are probably one or two Dutch that decided if they can do it to the north, we can do it to the south and east. And guess who traded in the medieval period? Dutch salesmen or sailors. So the conclusion is very clear. We need financial working markets. We need capital and working capital markets. If we get money, we can increase our consumption simply by trading over time. So I don't have the money now. You will have it tomorrow. I don't have to get the money now because somebody will lend it to me. And that helps me to increase my consumption. Guess what a Norwegian should have done in the Viking or in the, let's say, 800 years ago if he wanted to trade something that he couldn't pay for now? Go back, grow it on the ground, took probably half a year and then he got it and then sail once again. So he had to sail twice. Guess if that is cheap? No. So therefore, with a working capital and financial market, this increased trade makes it cheaper, improve the welfare of each involved. <coughs> and if you wake up one morning and listen to a service from, an, let's say, a French church with nice paintings inside, there is one gospel in this textbook and then we can compare this to a nice French church, because there are a lot of nice pictures in here, aren't they? I think there are a few nice pictures in here. Yeah? So then the gospel is, what stimulates trade is good for all of us. Because if we trade, we get more out of our resources. If we trade, we can use our resources more efficient. If we trade, we let others produce what we do not have to produce, but want to consume. And that's why we have Italian Lamborghinis, a few in here. Try to produce an Italian Lamborghini, for instance, in Molda. I'll give you two years and see what you come up with. It took it Italy many years to come up with Lamborghini. Only the Germans did it very quickly because they call it Daimler and Benz and now they call it Mercedes Benz, but that is <coughs> the exception. The traditional one is it will be more costly to do it ourselves. And then there is only one thing that Krugman is not fond of, and that is instruments that reduce the possibility to trade. I think that's is not very fond of environmental uh, related tariffs, like the carbon tariff. But I think that is a different story. So, when you leave now, you know one thing. Capital markets are needed. Financial institution must be sound, but will help trade. The reason why chapter 21 is important is very simple. It is a way to explain how we can improve the conditions for trade. So if you do not understand chapter 21, remember one thing when you start to read it once again, that is a way to improve the conditions for trade. Three o'clock, exactly. I plan to be precise this day. See you in 14 days, same place, same video, a different chapter. And that is a fair deal, I hope. Chapter 22. Have a nice Easter. If you break a leg, don't call me because the hospital is much better than this. <laughs>